Welcome everyone. We are here today as part of Career Services State of the Industries series. And this session today is a continuation of one we did in the spring called State of the Arts. And I'm very pleased to welcome Sam, Zach, and Doug to our panel. And they've graciously agreed to talk a little bit about what's going on in the arts industry from their perspective, from their organization's perspectives. And they're gonna to focus today on how they've innovated and been resilient in this time period and then offer you some strategies to do the same. So without further ado, I uh, welcome our panel and uh, I'm gonna do it in the order that I can see you. So I'm just gonna ask each panelist to introduce themselves starting with Zach, please. Hi, uh, my name is Zach Crone. Uh, I work for the Williamstown Theater Festival. Uh, I am the Director of Professional Training. And my name is Sam Bagellan. I am the Artistic Director of the Cherry Arts in Ithaca. And uh, yeah. And my name is Doug Levine. I'm the Executive Director of the State Theater of Ithaca in good old downtown Ithaca. Um, hopefully you guys have attended some shows here. Um, and uh, we're actually a, a historic theater. Um, we're currently in our 91st season. We opened in 1928. Um, and we are a 1600 seat theater. We have uh, 900 seats downstairs, 700 seats in our balcony. And we usually do about uh, 85 to 95 events a year. Wow, yeah. So um, if folks would like to just uh, talk a little more about your organization, what you do, and then uh, feel free to you know, share kind of how have things changed. Uh, so the Cherry Arts is um, uh, small, a tiny bit smaller than the State Theater. We are, uh, uh, as Min Min knows, we're about 1,100 square foot flexible space and um, we uh, program a variety of stuff, uh, in, uh, mostly in collaboration with other companies. So we host a wide variety of other uh, shows and other disciplines. Um, and we have the Cherry Artists Collective, which is our sort of in-house creative uh, team and uh, the collective produces about four shows a year and these tend to be international or multidisciplinary or experimental in some way. Uh, we range between 50 and 75 seats, um, depending, it's a flexible space. Um, so for us, um, initially, like I think like all theater companies, the, the fact of gathering the fact, like the impossibility of gathering is a really huge um, problem. We have been trying to take advantage of the fact that our, our work is usually multidisciplinary or experimental in some way. And so we pivoted for when we had to cancel our last production of the season, we created a, um, a new streaming work that we sort of commissioned from six writers we'd worked with before, international people, um, and we uh, and we created one very long kind of epic live stream show based on those new commissions, but they were written for streaming. And so um, so it allowed us to sort of experiment in the live stream genre uh, with sort of purpose built texts. And, um, but, you know, just the key, just the ongoingness of running the operation is very tricky because a lot of our income comes from uh, these collaborations, uh, uh, productions, that other people, do in the space and so the space is just sitting dormant and that is you know our revenue driver and usually um and allows us to make the work that we make so um we're planning to announce a season again like um take advantage of our uh experimentalness because we uh, we're in a position to say okay we're we're, we're just going to try to figure out what would four shows look like that use technology in unusual or different ways um, so that we can say we're doing four full productions. They're full productions. They're just not conventional theatrical productions. And our audience is a little, is kind of used to that. Um, so, so because of our mandate, I feel like we are in a better position uh, to be able to announce a season and say it's a full season and it's a real season. Um, uh, and it's not a compromised season. It's just, um, it's uh, an artistically pushed season. Um, and so, but we're figuring out what that might be and how to fund it, given that a lot of our income is not here. Um, 
anymore. So, so that's where that's where we are, and we're trying to figure out how to keep our staff on over the summer. <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. Thanks, Sam. Sam, did you guys uh, receive any like PPP funds or, or disaster money? We did. PPP funds is what actually kept us on full staff through making the, uh, through, you know, doing our final um, uh, production. And in fact, it sort of bought us some time. Um, so, um, but we're, you know, uh, we're so, so for a while it felt like we're fine. We, we canceled one show, but we made another right away. And uh, we lost a bunch of income, but a bunch of other income came in. And, um, uh, and now it's like, all right, this, now, now it's like hunkering down for the long haul. How about you guys? Um, yes, so uh, Doug Levine here from the State Theater, and uh, we, we hopped right on the PPP applications and the SBA EIDL disaster loan right away as well. Um, we received a nice chunk of money through, through both, actually. Um, although, so we got the PPP money, you know, seven, eight weeks ago, um, and the, the SBA disaster loan, we got approved last week. It's been like a months long process but we finally were 100% approved for a, a really nice chunk of money. Um, and we should be receiving that within the next 10 to 14 business days. Um, and that should really help us through really through at least half of 2021. Wow. So, so we're in a position, okay. you know, we're, if, if you don't mind, I'm just going to jump in and, and talk about the state theater. Um, so, you know, like I said, we're at an old historic theater, 1600 seats. Um, you know, we were one of the first ones to shut down, and I truly believe that that theaters like us and like live sporting events are going to be the last ones to reopen as well. I think there will be sporting events, but I think they will be crowdless for quite a while. Um, yeah. I don't know if you guys saw the the major outbreak in Italy was all tied to a soccer match. Um, you know, people screaming and hugging and jumping um, is not good for uh, keeping germs at at bay. Um, so I spent basically when all this went down March 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th, um, we had four of our biggest shows of the season lined up, uh, two sellouts and two other really, you know, well selling shows. Um, it was OAR, Jack Hanna, Tig Notaro, and then we were hosting a Cornell uh, veterinary conference on that Sunday. Um, but everything got completely wiped out um, that weekend. Um, and, uh, and really we've been shut down ever since, um, no shows whatsoever. Um, so like I said, I spent the, the, basically the first two weeks of March, just ravenously applying for these grants, um, which took a lot of time and effort. Like with the disaster loan, we had to calculate how much money we were losing through this disaster. Um, it literally is a, called a disaster loan. Um, but once we got through that and, and the depression started to subside, subside from myself, um, I kind of like gathered myself and said, hey, you know, we got we to gotta do something. So uh, I remember it was March 31st, we did our first live stream show. Um, and I will say we were originally planning on doing it from our stage on an empty stage. I thought it would just look so cool. Um, but we ran into some technical issues. Really what you need is a super, super high speed internet connection to make these live streams work. Um, and we learned it literally like that afternoon that it, it, we just didn't have enough bandwidth. Um, so we, you know, like good old COVID-19, we, we basically quickly readjusted and, and we had the artist do it from his living room. Um, and that was actually, his name is Joe Crookston. He tours all over the world, lives here in Ithaca. And we did our first live stream show that night. Um, and we ended up raising for three different organizations, us, the Community Foundation of Tompkins County, and for the artist himself, um, we ended up raising about $3,000 per organization and had over 10,000 people um, wow. watch, which is pretty amazing. That's great. Um, yeah. So less than two weeks later, we did another live stream with one artist. Um, uh, his name, he's also a local guy, Frank for Pony. Um, and it was definitely less than Joe Crookston because this artist doesn't really tour, but it was still, it was, you know, it got the name out there and, and we do, still raised some money. Um, and then we basically decided like, all right, we have that down. Let's, let's brainstorm what could work the best. So we saw that Giving Tuesday was coming up on Tuesday, May 5th. And we decided, you know, John Prine has played the State Theater numerous times. He was one of the early artists to succumb to, to COVID. Um, so we decided to do a John Prine tribute show. And we had about 12, 13 artists, both, you know, four were local, locally based, but they tour around the country. And then we had another like seven or eight that are like nationally known artists play John Prine tunes. And that one did really, really well. Um, we had, I think over like 12,000 people tune in, 12, 13,000 people tune in like live. Um, and then, uh, and we had, we raised over $10,000 with that show. 
And then just recently we did, on May 24th, we did a Bob Dylan birthday tribute. Um, and we had like Joan Baez, um, Sam Harris from the Ex Ambassadors. Uh, we had a really good lineup for this one. And we're over 35,000 views for that one. And again, over $10,000 raised um, after expenses as well. We, we, for that one, we decided to pay our artists too. Um, so that kind of, I think that helped with, with, uh, with um, getting some more donations in. Another thing that we did immediately, you know, that weekend, March 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th, I came up with some language and I'm gonna show this on the screen, but we have a beautiful um, prominent marquee right in the heart of downtown. So I'm gonna hold this up. Um, and this is our marquee. And if you could read it, it says, oh, it's backwards, sorry. But it says, we are all in this together, stay safe, be kind, um, some, some wording that I came up with. And it actually like went viral. Um, it was picked up by the Wall Street Journal. It's been shared on social media over 250 times. Um, and it's really been like a, like a pinpoint for this whole uh, pandemic. Um, so one thing for the, both the Prime show and the, uh, uh, the Dylan one, we actually offered any donation, $100 or more, um, besides your great good old thank you letter, we, we, are set, we sent out these 11 by 14 prints, limited edition prints of these photos as well. And I think that really helped us with donations as well. We, we got a lot of new donors in. Um, so when all said and done, we now have, we've had about 450 people who have donated to the State Theater since the middle of March that have never donated before. And as a non nonprofit, that's huge. You know, some of them are 10 bucks, um, but some, you know, many of them have been $100 or more. So that's been really great. So moving forward, I'll just say that, um, like I said, I thought that the State Theater and, and sporting events and, you know, basically live performances, it's gonna be a while. Um, I, think, I think right now in New York State, they're allowing gatherings up to 25 people. But let's just say people in Ithaca are not flocking to hang out with 25 people anytime soon. Right. So we are preparing right now at this time. I mean, we're not expecting any shows whatsoever for the rest of 2020. Um, and we're looking at probably like early spring 2021 or until there's a prominent vaccine that we can actually start having live performance again. So in the meantime, I've been investing in live stream equipment. Um, we've talked to other artists and they're interested in doing live stream shows, but they don't want to do them from their house. They don't have good internet. Um, so we've invested in a very, very high speed internet connection from our stage. And I've also, um, I'm raising money currently to pay for, you know, some high definition video cameras, um, some switcher boards, some, some of the ethernet cable, and of, of course a high end computer to run everything. We already have the audio equipment, of course, because we're a theater. But um, we're looking to really ramp up our live stream concert series. And uh, like I said, we have a lot of prominent musicians that tour all around that, that are within three, four hour driving distance from here that want to come to the State Theater to do a concert. Additionally, we're right in the heart of downtown Ithaca where the Commons is, and we are going to host um, the summer concert series live stream from our stage this summer as well. That's starting July 9th. Um, so basically, I have about $15,000 of equipment that to purchase so far i've raised about half of that and i know that one of the foundations i applied for is meeting this afternoon and i'm hoping to have some good news tomorrow morning about this as well guys. um that's the other right. thing moving forward one of the one of the uh yeah one of, one of the arguments that i had is that i think moving forward you know there's a number of audience members that are not going to flock back to live shows so i think when when things quote start getting back to normal we will offer the live ticket of course but we're thinking that we might also offer the live stream ticket as well so yeah. you can have a password and actually able to sit at home and, and watch the shows. You know, this is also where, you know, our, this theater was well built, built well before ADA was, was around. And, you know, we do have um, some ramps and, and some, some handicapped seating here and whatnot, but it's still, it's not the greatest experience. So, so for some people that, that have trouble um, getting out, um, they can just sit at home. You know, some people old that are, up there in age that, that just don't want to travel out of the house. Now they'll have the option to buy a live stream ticket too. So, sorry, I know I talk really fast, but if anyone has any questions about that now or, or later, let me know. Maybe I'll just let Zach speak from here. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, Dave. no, totally. No, that, that sounds really exciting actually. Um, yeah, so the Williamstown Theater Festival is a, a summer theater festival in Williamstown, Massachusetts. Um, and we are in, kind of the bizarre, you know, like not bizarre to all the other summer stocks, but maybe bizarre to the other two compared to the other two um, organizations today in that 98% of all of our programming is during June, July, and August. Um, and that's where we make 99% of our revenue. Um, so, you know, March, January, February, and March leading up to the summer, that's kind of our ramp up time. 
and the time where we start getting really, really busy with preparations and with contracting and with logistics and all of that. So when coronavirus kind of shut down everything in mid-March, we were still preparing for a whole summer season. Nothing had actually happened. We hadn't actioned anything yet. So we were in kind of the best and the worst spot because, you know, we weren't, um, we didn't have a lot of, we had no one on site. Um, we didn't have any contracts out yet. Um, we had made arrangements for all of that, but nothing had really happened yet for us. Um, so that was both a blessing and a curse. Um, so we had to figure out kind of in real time, like what to do. All of our season is dependent on the summer and people flocking to, you know, the Williams College campus um, to see live theater. We do mostly theater. We have seven main stage productions on two stages. But then we also do, um, you know, we do concerts, we do benefit performances, we do live readings every week. Um, we do, you know, we have a whole training program that uh, operates a black box with its own complete season. So, you know, there's a, a bunch of things that are really, we had to think about um, kind of in each individual silo. So kind of our tentpole productions, our main stage productions, uh, we wanted to pivot. We didn't want to just um, have them kind of vanish into thin air. So our artistic director started a conversation with Audible, uh, which is uh, a big uh, podcasting company uh, that is now owned by Amazon. And through uh, weeks and weeks of conversations, we have teamed up with Audible and we have announced and are working towards releasing seven audio play versions of the seven productions that we would have produced this summer um and that that is super cool and that's really exciting and that also comes with its own separate um set of questions and um hardships and problems you know that we have to try to to solve um you know our plays what we are running into now um is that a lot of our plays don't necessarily work in the exact same form as an audio play mm -hmm. um because you don't have the visual component. And so, you know, when uh, someone enters unbeknownst upstage, for instance, like how to do that over audio play um, has been an interesting um, problem, you know, something to, to, to look into. Um, so we're sort of in that phase of the summer. Um, working with Audible, we are also figuring out uh, how to do these how to actually produce these plays it's funny we don't we have never produced a podcast before we have never done audio plays um so this is all kind of uncharted territory obviously audible um has a long history of this and they have been doing this for years and years um so we're sort of taking their lead however you know like they are also in new uncharted territories because a lot of their audio play is auto, a lot of their podcasting and a lot of the things that they produce are recorded live in a soundstage with lots of other people yeah. too. So they have also had to kind of pivot how they produce work as well. Um, there was a long time where, when we didn't know, we still kind of don't know what's happening to the world in the next couple of months, but there was a world in which we were going to wait to hold rehearsals until we could congregate in a small room together. Um, once New York State kind of opened up to like 10, 12, 15 people, um, but now we're thinking that because we don't know when that might be, um, we are now pivoting yet again to kind of figure out how to do this in a remote world. So uh, we have the actors who are going to do our production in Williamstown. They've all signed on to the Audible audio plays. Um, but now it's, it's, you know, just like everyone else, it's like we have had to pivot from becoming a theater festival to becoming like a digital tech company. Um, which as you know, is strange and we're all learning new things that I never thought I would ever be able to add to my resume. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, it's, it's really real. Just like the other guys were talking about, you have to kind of in real time yeah. figure out how to get the job done uh, in maybe a different way, which has been, you know, bending without breaking has been important in the last couple of months. Um, so now, just to circle back to the Audible thing, we are now figuring out with Audible what is the best way to like send the tech to yeah. the actor so that they can record and deliver to Audible and the producers 
you know, high definition files that then get, you know, remixed and chopped and screwed and, you know, put together. Um, so we are in the process of doing that. We have also pivoted to try to do as much virtual programming as possible. Um, again, something we don't regularly do just because we are so physical in person in space. Um, so, you know, we have a couple of community engagement initiatives that we run year round. Um, figuring out how to be Zoom experts has been um, also interesting, um, but doing, you know, playwriting intensives over Zoom. It's just, you know, a different way of doing theater. Um, so that is what we are currently in the middle of now. Uh, there will not be any in-person activity at our theater this summer. Um, so, you know, readjusting to all of that has been, has been wild. Yeah. I'll bet. Yeah, go right can, ahead, Sam. Can you say, um, Zach, tell, uh, I have a couple of thoughts. I like, I, I have been talking to, I, you're not the first theater company I've talked to and known of who's pivoted to the audio book space or the radio play space. Um, I think the early experiments with Zoom readings and Zoom productions have been by and large like um, disappointing in a sense. And also in terms of the amount of bandwidth as um, Doug was saying, the amount of bandwidth to get live streamed video into people's living rooms is tr it's, it's, it's tremendous on the um, you know, on the, on the delivery end, on the, on the stage end. Um, but then also, you're really vulnerable to people, you know, people complain when their video gets out of sync with their audio, even if you know your stream went out, like, um, <laughs> and then, and then the, and then the ad, the like, the aesthetic ad of the, of the image, if it's really just looks like what we're looking at now, um, it's not that great, you know what I mean? And so, and so I, I really am, I'm very, uh, uh, I think it makes a lot of sense to pivot to a highly produced, like beautifully produced audio event um, that just uses the possibilities, you know, to the fullest. That, now that uh, said, I'm curious, to, are, are the people going to record, are you going to do any kind of live, like are they recording in real time with each other? Yeah, uh, you know, it's it's interesting. We haven't really gotten to that. I mean, in th it, yes, we hope, just because that will hopefully deliver the best, you know, acting um, in this new world. Yeah. Um, but it is it has been tricky. We have done readings, internal readings of all of these shows in preparation for um, an audible rehearsal period. Um, and for all of the um, items that you have listed, it has been tricky, um, depending on, you know, the individual actor's bandwidth and, you know, the delay, <laughs> just yeah. reading a play, just reading a play sometimes can be like, I'm pausing. Is that, are you, is that a dramatic pause or can you not hear me? Did you, <laughs> so it's like, did you all freeze of that. or are you being exactly. still? <laughs> exactly. So yeah. that has been a really interesting um, thing to have to add to a mix where, that you don't ever have to think about that when you're all around a table together. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, hopefully in theory, uh, we will be uh, recording in real time. However, you know, we can make that the most feasible. Okay. But yeah, everyone if would I, individually have their own. Yeah. Yeah. If, yeah. I, if I can cut in right now, I, I just want to. So I've I've done four of these now, and our first two were true live stream shows. Um, the first one actually went really smoothly. Um, the second one, despite buying, you know, the, the artist buying the new router and whatnot, there was definitely, uh, like, the actual entire show crashed about an hour in, and then we got back up and running, but we lost viewers. You know, you live and learn. So when we decided to do this big John Prine show with international artists and the Dylan one, um, I will tell you that we pre-recorded. We basically asked the artists to send us their videos um, ahead of time, and then we actually put the entire show together, you know, like, four days in advance. Um, and then we actually uploaded it with, uh, it's, it's a, a tool called Restream um, that allows us to broadcast it on both Facebook Live and YouTube simultaneously. Um, but what that does is it ensures a perfectly smooth show. And, yeah. and we had zero complaints either time. The, the only thing that happened that we saw with the Dylan show, because we had, it, it basically went viral, like Variety Magazine um, touted it, like 
well, ahead, ahead of time. I mean, the Village Voice, it, it got, uh, or not the Village Voice, someone, another similar publication down in New York City. Time out. We got a lot of press ahead of time. I mean, Dylan fans are kind of crazy anyway, so it, it really <laughs> caught fire. But with the Dylan show, Smart. we actually were um, targeted by bots during the show where people were putting up fake donation links um, and we caught, we deleted them really quickly and, and we're figuring out, we figured out how we can avoid that in the future. But, um, you know, that's kind of like the product of your success. We became a target of bots. But just to back up, you know, we found that doing everything ahead of time and putting the show together, you know, I recorded my parts ahead of time. I'll, after we do this, I'll send you the link, at least to the Dylan show. It's on YouTube. So you can check yeah. it out. But like, I'm really happy with the production value. It, 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 and we, and like you said, Zach, like we have learned all new jobs, um, yeah. you know. And like totally. my marketing director can now put together an hour and a half concert like this. Um, and, and he's basically like a movie producer now. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. And yeah. I'm, I'm like yeah. a YouTube yeah. star. It's crazy. <laughs> someone in the um, parking lot, you know, I'm used to people, while I'm shopping at Wegmans, people asking me, that, hey, when is Neil Young coming? But, um, you know, in the Wegmans parking lot, someone was like, dude, I saw you introduce, you know, the diligence. Like, it's kind of weird that people recognize me that way now. Um, but but totally. anyway. I will say that it's it's a lot less stressful if you can do it all in advance and, and up for for at least for my organization it was a yeah. lot less stressful to upload it and just if you just you actually have it all set 24 hours in advance and you just sit back with your friends um, I actually when it actually played I had it projected in my backyard with some socially distanced friends and we just watched it out in my backyard it was pretty yeah. sweet. that's awesome it's definitely that's a pre-recording is that I mean it's definitely a conversation you hear and I um and um uh, where it's mainly come up in theater companies, I think, is, for example, um, where there's no consensus of, like, how do you make the art? Um, but a lot of people did did online, did Zoom readings, um, and now it's evolving into other sorts of uh, ideas. But a lot of people, for example, in their, for their online galas, which are we, uh, having moved our gala online, then we've indefinitely postponed it um, for all of the other reasons. Uh, the... Um, but everybody was realizing, you know what, this is really going to be a pain to get all of those people um, lined up in real time, and it's going to crash, and it's going to be horrible. So, I, so, so, um, there was a lot of people uh, talking about, well, maybe for the gala, it doesn't all have to be live. <laughs> you know, well, maybe the hosts will be live, and then we'll just press play. Um, and then once you're doing that, um, it's interesting, is it? Like, because you guys so are a presenting company. Um, Doug, like the state theater, right? Like you, you book in acts that that exist uh, for the most part, right? We're no, um, actually, we're we're a unique organization in that we're kind of a, we have a hybrid business model where we do uh, present about fifteen shows of our own every year that are in like the family series or the community series. Right. Um, so we do about fifteen of those, and then we do we do all the movies. We do about one well, in a normal year. We do about twelve movies a year, twelve classic movies. Um, like we were going to do Jaws during Ithaca Festival because it's the 45th anniversary. Um, and we try to do movies, you know, that, you know, like Rocky Horror Picture Show, Big Lebowski, things that draw a crowd. Um, but we have a unique relationship with, with DSP shows, Dan Smalls, um, where he actually rents the theater from us about 30 right. to, to 45 times a year as well. Um, so, so I guess I guess what I'm saying is not I, I probably got the terminology wrong, but okay. your main your main identity is not like we make art. Right, like it's you come to us to yeah. see amazing performance, but it's not like we develop. And so, yeah. so I think as a theater company, when your identity is we make live art, it's harder to, it's harder for that work to be pre-recorded. Or you're kind of a film company, or you're a multimedia company. But then, what, like, what is the compelling thing? Yeah. And I think this is what, this is what you know, Williamstown is probably wrestling with you release something we didn't even talk about it, but I'm curious what you guys are thinking is like you release an like a podcast you release an audiobook is there something do you plan a launch that is like the first live playing of it that can bring people together can create a sense of liveness or do you just like put it out in the world like as I I've been listening to novels now <laughs> and so mm -hmm. I have audio you know so I have um uh I forget what this what the company is called um uh, the uh, Audible um, on my, uh, you know, and I could picture a play reading pop up from Williamstown. I'd be like, awesome, click. Um, but it wouldn't, there wouldn't be a sense of the event or the liveness of it that Doug, you're talking about with the live stream stuff. Right. But I'm curious what you guys think of that, Zach. 
Yeah, you know, the, those are definitely conversations that we have been having. Um, add to that the fact, you know, like on a nor in a normal summer, we would have, you know, a festival opening celebration. There would be one time where we'd open a show on both of our stages at the same time. At mm -hmm. the very end of June, we'd have, you know, lots of dancing. We'd have music. We'd have, like, all of it. Um, that obviously can't happen this year. So trying to replicate that or even think about, can we replicate that in this kind of new world? Um, we initially, when we were all starting to talk about this audible experiment and we didn't really know a whole lot, we're like, oh yeah, well, we'll, we'll drop all of, the, all of our shows at the same time. And then we'll have a big event that kind of centered around like, well, now here is the Williamstown season available to everyone all the time. But then once we started talking to it, and of course, an audible was like, what are you, you're joking? Because obviously it takes a lot longer depending on what the actual product is. So one of the seven shows that we are doing is a musical. And a musical obviously it just has so many more components to it. Um, so not only do you have like a text, but you have music, which has to be learned, which has to be recorded. It's mixed. There's a lot of group numbers. And then you think about the musicians involved and you think about you know like kind of putting together and assembling all of that well that's going to take much longer than you know mm -hmm. our four-person kitchen sink drama that doesn't revolve around anything other than just like four people talking so we are going through currently conversations about okay well if they're not all released at the same time what do we release at the same do we release anything at the same time is there an event for the first thing that we release, or is it every single time? You know, like it is, we, we haven't figured that out yet. We are still very much in talks. Also, we don't know that these will be summer productions necessarily because, you know, we will have to rehearse for a couple of weeks. Recording takes about a week. And then Audible has told us that it will take about a month in post to make it into like a podcast. So you're already talking about two months and we haven't really started. We haven't selected a date for those rehearsals to begin. So these podcasts or these audio plays probably are not going to be released until September, October. And that's the time when we're already planning our next season in a typical, you know, year. So what does that mean for us? You know, it's, it's no longer a, you know, like it ha it's been right. detached from the stage. It's been detached from the summer. It's been, you know, so it's sort of like, it's a whole new thing. We have to approach it like it's completely different so we've kind of thrown everything out the window and are trying to figure out you know what, yeah. what that means for us yeah totally so one of the things i want to uh sort of slide into is something uh that doug said because what i'm hearing are amazing amounts of innovation and as doug put it <laughs> we're doing jobs we've never before learned how to do or been trained to do and yet each organization and each of you are doing exactly that. Yeah. So for a young professional who, whether that's someone who's currently in school or someone who's transitioning from school to the workforce and had an idea of I'm going to have an arts career, whether that was performance or arts management or, you know, anything in between, what advice do you have for them to sort of take on that same ethos and, and be resilient and innovative? Um, I mean, just, you gotta stay involved with, with, uh, like the latest trends, the latest technology. I mean, I get, I, I get inundated with email every day, but, but I do read through it and, and, you know, I, whether it's from my ticketing company or from the industry, um, you have to just see, I mean, we, we basically had to research, um, how to broad, I mean, anyone could broadcast something on Facebook live if you have a Facebook account and that's how we did our first two. But um, we learned that a lot of our fans do not have Facebook or social media. Um, some of the older ones just want to be able to watch it on YouTube. So we had to kind of do some research and figure out how to stream on both. Um, in fact, we can even stream on Instagram now too. Um, so, uh, you know, I would say just, just, you know, read as much as you can and, and keep your finger on the pulse of the industry, basically. Um, that's really helped me and my organization. And, and also for that matter, um, you know, we've made a lot of friends over the years and just at just reaching out and asking people for advice or, or even like training. Um, 
and 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 do the same. You know, Zach, if you need help with restream, certainly let me know. You know, my marketing director, I can put you in touch with him. Um, yeah, that's great. Yeah, I mean, it, we're as I said, we are all in this together, and um, and you know, we 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 haven't turned our back on anyone for advice, anything. So and 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 it goes what goes around comes around. So a number of of other larger organizations have helped us out too. Um, so it's it's uh, it's. It's, it's definitely been a learning process for sure. And yeah. Sure. Also like marketing these events is, is totally different than marketing like a live show at the state theater too. Um, you know, we're, I mean, we've had things go viral that we never expected to go viral that have really put us on the map, which, which has been great. It's exciting. Yeah. Yeah. We, I mean, for our live stream show, we sold more tickets. I mean, but that, it's not like in the 30,000, people yeah. range we're still making experimental international <laughs> you know theater um but we uh uh but we sold more tickets than we had budgeted to sell for the live show that we canceled you know and we're sad about and um and we sold fewer than we normally would have in Ithaca from people who are like I'm you know I'm, I'm bummed that I can't go to the theater and I'm not interested in a live stream substitute but then a bunch of people from around the country and even internationally did buy tickets. And so that was great. Um, uh, and it was amazing. It was a real, um, yeah, it was a huge learning experience. Everybody was like live, like 13 actors were live streaming into a Skype call, you know, yeah. turning their video on and off with a stage manager in one place and a video mixer in another place. It was um, uh, like, it was a crazy experiment. Um, but very exciting and and that it had that liveness and had that possibility of things going wrong that is the that's part of like uh liveness and sometimes they did <laughs> um in one case like um in one case the stage manager like it, as i said it was intercut between six um six texts uh uh and that were all written for live stream and one night um someone's video just wouldn't work they just uh and the uh, and they had while they troubleshot it, they changed the order of the scenes. Um, they were like, you know, and they're doing this all by uh, the chat function in the Skype room. And it was like, <laughs> like Loza, you're on deck. Everybody ready? And you know, we're gonna push this one back. And uh, um, but the audience never knew. Um, so it was really like weirdly like theater. But then it was like weird. Then it was like kind of very sadly not like theater because it had all of the urgency it had all of the 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 liveness but there was no clapping audience there was no you know all of the actors at the end of this like super intense exciting experience go click and then they're just at home you know immediately there's no like woo woo um <laughs> so that was a so you know this is good this is a thing that's going to be like an emotional challenge even as we even as we continue to refine and make the uh, make art that can be very exciting and, and have a live component and be really look better than a Zoom call, um, it will be the liveness, the the the, the gatheringness, not the liveness, but the gathering in one room together is really um, that loss is going to start taking an increasing toll, I think, on our artists. I can speak for myself on that, <laughs> you know, um, that uh, that as much as, you know, we can work with technology to create other kinds of things, um, it's going to be increasingly challenging just to keep our spirits up, you know, I think is really going to, is really going to start to be, um, one of the critical projects, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that I think that that brings up a good point and something that we've talked about internally is that you know we are pivoting. Like this is definitely a pivot for us. We are not trying to replicate the experience one hundred percent of going to a theater and watching a play in the same way. Um, so we are never trying to replicate all of that. And I do think that we, we, as our company, we have to keep that in mind because, you know, theater will come back. Like the traditional theater will come back. We don't know when, we don't know how, but like it will come back. Um, and so in the meantime, what, are, what kind of art are we creating? It's going to be a little bit different. It's going to look different um, to earlier points. You know, you, you can reach 
a, a lot more people. You have the potential to speak to a much larger community. Some people in the community who would normally come aren't going to come because they don't do the online thing. You know, the, the act of watching something on Zoom is like inherently and fundamentally different than watching it in the theater. So, you know, what are the benefits? What are things that you can't get in the theater that you can get over Zoom? Like actually being intentional about what we're creating and, you know, like put, putting a pause on our traditional theater. We'll come back to it. But in the meantime, what can we create? What can we kind of make together that um, is no less um, impactful but you know, it, it affects you a little bit differently um, because I do think that that will in a couple of years or next year, hopefully sooner rather than later, like people will miss that and coming back into a theater will create kind of like, oh, I've missed this. Like this is what it's about. And I think that um, until we can fulfill that, we're going to make and do other things. So I do think being yeah. flexible while realizing that like this is other, like this can still be awesome, but this is not a one for one you know, transfer has been you yeah. know, important for us. Totally. And I would say in terms of um, uh, like advice, as Doug said, like just staying flexible and staying on top of new technology, there are a ton of, there's a ton of opportunity here, especially I think for like young people who haven't yet sort of defined like, oh, I am this kind of a designer or this kind of a director. Um, because, um, you know, the young, the guy, um, uh, Noah Elman, who had been my assistant director on the show that we canceled, came over to be the assistant director on the show that the live stream show and then rapidly, as we decided we were going to do an elaborate video thing with like live mixing the different videos and uh, with filters and, and different shapes and animations and all that, he became a super expert on this and he, and now this is a sort of this is a skill that's in demand. And uh, so hopefully he'll be able to get kind of uh, a lot of work making this sort. I mean, certainly I'm hoping he'll work on every show we do, you know, uh, next season. And that will be those, that will be like in a major design position as opposed to like, he could assist a director a little more, you know, like that, there's, that's a much more opportunity available for him in our company because of, this new medium that opened up and so if you can find yourself a spot by jumping in you can really you can really make yourself indispensable quite quickly as we all learn all these new skills right exactly and that's 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 the piece that is exciting when you think about sorry somebody just knocked on the door live streaming from home <laughs> but, it, but it's really the part that's interesting when you think about what might things look like on the other side of COVID-19 with these new skill sets, these new avenues to explore delivering art, right? And, and that's very exciting. So, yeah. I'd like to just offer uh, folks who are watching this an opportunity to, um, <laughs> I have somebody knocking at the door. <laughs> the door we don't use, I might add. <laughs> but I'd like to offer folks from the audience the opportunity to ask questions. If you have any, uh, feel free to turn on your camera and your microphone. Hi, or, I see Barbara Adams is there. Hello, Barbara. Yeah, Barbara's there. Or type them in the box if you wish. This is pathetic. I'm driving and watching at the same time. Sorry. Be safe, Barbara. <laughs> I, have, hey, hey, I know I have a one o'clock appointment, but this is fascinating. One question, and maybe Doug, this is, yep. you already covered this, but you've invested in all this new equipment. Is any of this available for other groups to rent to do productions from your stage? Uh, the answer to that is yes. Um, when I say rent, though, it means it's not going to leave the theater. You're basically renting the stage. Yes. I'll just tell you that um, uh, yesterday morning I had a, a meeting with a regular renter of the theater, the Ithaca Ballet Company. Um, they do the Nutcracker for five performances every December. And, you know, that's their cash cow. Um, it basically funds them for the rest of the year. And we're looking at a, a reality that it might not happen like it, it very likely will not happen the way it normally has happened for the past 45 years. Um, so they are considering doing some sort of live stream performance uh, from our stage this year. So, so the answer is yes. Um, it's not available 
right away. We want to actually perfect it ourselves first. So that will take like the summer concert series, get a few of those under our belt. But I would say by like end of August, early September, that is absolutely a possibility. Yes. That's good. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Yep. We should have a conversation. Yeah. Yeah. And Sam, uh, I, as you know, I was unable to review the first yes. show because yes. of where I live and I have more yes. access. And now what I do is uh, when I have to review, I go down to IC and I sit outside right. and it will scream like that. But uh, do you have a taped version of that that you could share? Because everybody's yes, great. I can. Oh, good. I'm glad you heard good yeah, things. Yeah. I, can, I can, you know, because of um, uh, like union regulations and the agreement with the cast and the feeling of life that was designed to be a live event, we were we're not sort of broadcasting it to the general public. Um, yes, no, I and, understand. But, but, but for like review for critics and, and people with special yeah. relationships, well, we, we can link you up. Yeah. yeah, I would I would love that because then it gives me, I, I made a quick shout out in my last review to it. I don't know if you saw that. Oh, I missed it, I missed it, I'm sorry. In the hangar review, I mentioned yours. <laughs> but but um, uh, if I saw it in depth, then I could, you know, because all these things are going to evolve, and then I have the knowledge of that. Yes, that I, would I would love that, touch. Barbara. Yes, thanks for, yeah. Yeah. yeah, cool, I'll send you that. I'll make myself a note. Thank you. Hey, Zach, most of the content that you're planning on doing um, through Audible, is it all uh, like brand new creative content? You know what it, yeah, uh, yeah. So we, uh, so out of the seven plays that we are producing yes. with Audible, uh, five of them are world premieres. Great, great. Uh, we're also doing uh, Streetcar Named Desire and then another show that premiered on the West End. So it's not okay. new, it's newish. Uh, but yeah, for the, the reason most I bring part, that up, I mean, I haven't run into this myself because it's live music, and but I know like the hangar in the kitchen um, have run into some issues, like live streaming current, you know, yeah. works that have been out for a while. You know, there's uh, some rights issues, copyright issues, that kind of thing. So it's, yeah, it's it, yeah, it's definitely something that we thought about. It's one of the reasons that we also haven't really done yet. Uh, some theaters are like opening up their archives yeah. and mm -hmm. uh, streaming works that they have already produced as like a, another source of ticket generation. Yep. And we have decided not to do that for a couple of reasons, but it, it one of the big reasons is kind of the agreements and the contracts and, and all of that. It's just a different, yep. it's a new horizon that hasn't really been addressed in the way right, that it probably is. should by all the unions. Yeah. yeah. So Equi equity is like equity and Zag are <laughs> hammering it all out as fast as they can. But uh, yeah, yeah, Europe happens so much faster. And so like everybody for a while, everybody was watching like, which is great for like me personally, everyone's watching suddenly the Schaubühne and the, <laughs> mm -hmm. the Berliner Ensemble and, uh, and uh, National Theater in Britain because yeah. their, their union um, relationships are different. Um, uh, yeah, have you found that the, that the playwrights um, who are all presumably like, except for these two are like living playwrights that you're, you've presumably close relationship with, are they open to rewrites to effectively make these into radio plays or, or do you read some stage directions? Like what, how are you finding that process? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. So we have decided through Audible, Audible has a really strong um, opinion that they don't like stage directions read when they do audio plays and they do things like this. So it really has, uh, complicated and probably a good artistic way how to kind of work around that. Mm -hmm. um, we do have a couple of playwrights who are altering big sections of the play wow. to, to accommodate for an audio play. Um, a couple of them have worked in the audio play format and um, you know it's it, again because it is so different and all you have are your ears and what you're listening to you do have to craft the story and the dialogue in a much different way. So we do have a couple of playwrights who have done that and that have, you know, skills at doing that. So yeah, there are um, a couple of plays that are having uh, massive rewrites. <laughs> Hello, Mary, walking through the door. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and that's the thing with, with Streetcar, you know, it's set and there are a couple yeah. of moments in Streetcar where either the audience has to know something that the characters don't or there's you know visuals that are going on and how we have to do that with a dead playwright and you know a pretty fixed text is going to be a task 
So yeah, yeah you we can't are change the dialogue and just no, exactly. Like <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So it is going to be yeah, a little wild. bit uh, complicated. Yeah, definitely. That's pretty fascinating. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, and again, it's something that we would have never thought about. We don't have to think about when we're doing it as a play. It's like yeah. a very you, audio. Are you planning? Uh, what does audio? What does Audible feel about sort of sound effects, foley, underscore music, all of that stuff? Is that all part of the plan? Yeah, so that's, it's, it's really interesting. Our sound designers are being brought on yeah. along with the project. You know, unfortunately, uh, you know, there's not a whole lot of like costume design or right, like lighting light design or like, yeah, that. set design. <laughs> but uh, the sound designers but, all have tracks through with us because Foley will be a huge part of the process and will be a huge um, way in which the audience can kind of get a sense of what's happening, the setting, the place, the environment. Uh, so yeah, there's going to be a lot of work for the sound designer. And again, it's probably for some of them much different than designing mm -hmm. you know, sound for a theater. So it's going to expand lots of people's uh, horizons. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very old school in a lot of ways. I mean, almost getting yeah. back to radio plays. Yeah, very much, very much that. Oh, very cool. I think we have time for one more question if anybody else in our audience has one. This has been packed with amazingly interesting information, by the way. And a little bit of networking going on, too, which is always yeah, great. Really. Pleasure. Always. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Oh, Zach, are you an, an IC alum? Uh, no, I'm not. We, you know, we have a strong connection with Ithaca just because we love the students who come out of Ithaca. Um, and we have a, a lot Thank of you. them each summer. Yeah, no, definitely. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we like to keep up relations. But no, I myself went to school uh, in the South. Cool. Hello. Yeah, Luke, go right ahead. Hi. Um, well, as an Ithaca College student, um, I work for WICB, the radio station, and I also love theater. And I never really saw those two things possibly mm. intersecting in any way. <laughs> um, so it's actually kind of cool that, that COVID has like brought together theater and, ah. and radio. So I don't know, just what are your thoughts on like maybe radio plays coming back? and like being broadcast in that way. I just think it's really interesting. One of the pieces that we are looking at, um, we're thinking of doing, again, like everything we do, we'll have a live component because that's part of the, you know, what we've decided, how we've decided to approach this season. But one of the plays, um, and it, we're helped by the fact that our, the plays we do are never like, we, there's no kitchen sink drama. And so we, there's, there's always sort of, it seemed to be a way to present the play that feels like artistically achieved, that's not realistic because the plays are in a realism space. And, and one of the plays, as we read it online to see, is this still a play we should be thinking about? Um, we were like, oh, it's not only a play we should be thinking about, it's a play that works really well as a sound, as an oral play, like that actually, I don't know that, I think we'll always want to have some visual component, but I think there's one that will sort of be like, you know what, this, where, where like maybe the visual component will be like showing the person doing the sound effects live and the person talking to the microphone, but it is really that it'll be designed as like um, a sound event that you can watch the creation of. Um, uh, and. Uh, and I'm quite excited about that because it's actually about a guy who runs, like, it's set in the 70s and he has a little radio station that like two, two people listen to and he goes into stories out of that. So there's a way thematically that it makes sense as a kind of a radio play. Um, so, and, and it's just, it's only when you said WICB that I thought, oh, what would it be then to actually stream that on radio stations? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, that could be really cool. Like cool sort of. Uh, collaborations or connections. Yeah, well, hit me up if you have any. <laughs> <I> <laughs> programming at WICB.org. <laughs> That's great. I love that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, I do yeah, think that you. that brings up, I think that brings up a really interesting point of like, uh, it's really interesting to see what all people are interested in and what they have experience doing, even if they never think you know, multiple hobbies or multiple interests are going to intersect. You really don't know. <laughs> and moments like this, um, it has been interesting to your point. Uh, I've had a couple of 
interned candidates, a couple of directing candidates approach me and say like, oh my gosh, I have actually worked on a couple of radio plays a couple of years ago. I love that. And I had no idea that this would ever be coming back around. Or I would be, this <laughs> skill would be useful in any kind of way. You know, like uh, even if you, again, have hobbies or have interests or have skill sets that you think are so uh, separate, you never know when they're going to come back and when those skills are going to be useful and needed actually. Um, so cultivating as much um, far reaching yeah. um, skills and hobbies, I think is great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. I totally agree. Yeah. Make yourself great. as well-rounded a person as you can, develop all those weird nooks and crannies you never know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, sadly, this brings us pretty much to time. Um, I want to say thank you uh, to everybody for a really robust discussion, um, fascinating things going on. And it would be interesting, um, perhaps if you're so inclined to maybe check back in the fall and do this again, if you're yeah. interested. I I'm would love that. Sure. Cool. I'm so, <laughs> yeah. So um, just a shameless plug from me, uh, we're gonna do this series all summer long across different industries. And so since things intersect as we were talking about, do uh, check out what else we've got coming on over the next couple of months. And finally, just uh, for the students or recent grads, um, career services remains open. We're taking appointments. And if there's anything we can do to help you with your career development now or in the future, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. We want you to get where you want to be. All right. With that, I say thank you and I love it. <laughs> I look forward to talking to you all Thanks, soon. Thanks everyone. Great, yeah. to, great to meet you, Zach. Good thank to you. see you. Nice meeting y'all. Hi, everybody. Bye.